I read this to you uh, almost a year ago. Sometimes there comes a time that we have to be more specific as signs are given. You know, we're told in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, that God placed the lights in the heavens, and he placed them there for signs and for seasons. And incidentally, do you know what 14 stands for in numerics, biblically? Deliverance and salvation. It usually always has to do with the coming of the Savior. So that's going to be in this lecture today, so be sure and pay attention to it. Now, what about December solstice? That would be December the 21st. It is the moment when the Earth's north pole is tilted most away from the sun, giving midwinter for our northern hemisphere, midsummer for the southern. The sun appears to travel along the ecliptic, a great circle that has to cross every other great circle at two points. And one of these great circles is the Gallic Equator, or what we would call midline of the Milky Way. In 2012, the instant of the solstice, in December the 21st, that's the 11th hour, the 12th minute universal time, the solstice point like all points on the ecliptic, moves slowly westward, rightward, at about 170 seconds uh, of a degree per year because of the precession. The claim is that in 2012 it will have arrived at the exact point where the ecliptic crosses the Gallic e galactic equator. This will last have happened 25,800 years ago the length of the professional cycle. 25 is forgiveness of sins. 8 is new beginnings. Now, we need to take a closer look at this, though. What happened 14 years ago? 14 years ago, this particular sign touched, consider the Milky Way to be a wide river of stars, of dust, and the, the uh, ecliptic was touched 14 years ago. Now, 14 has to do with, uh, again, with deliverance and salvation. But now God, when he puts a sign in the heavens, 25,800 years ago was back in the first earth age. Doesn't come along that often. So we need to pay real close attention to this. It hit the very edge in the year of our Lord, 1998. That was 14 years ago. 14 being deliverance and salvation. What do you think was happening there in that year? 1998. August the 20th. U.S. Embassy bombings, the United States military launches cruise missile attacks against alleged al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan and a suspected chemical plant in Sudan in retaliation for the August 7th bombings of American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. It started. So again, the sign is there. Okay. Now, um, then what else happened? November the 20th, a court in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan declares accused terrorist Osama bin Laden a man without sin in regard to the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. Of course, we know that's not true. We know he had a great deal to do with it. What happened three and a half years after this, approximately? There were four bound angels, as it's written in Revelation chapter 9, verse 14, 14 being deliverance and salvation, loosed. Each evil spirit in an airplane, one for each of the towers, one for the Pentagon, 
and one in a field in Pennsylvania because our people woke up as to what was happening. You know, evil spirits don't die in crashes, but idiots do, okay? And I'm not talking about the innocents, I'm talking about the people that caused it. So you see, this means a great deal to us, these signs of the end times. Um, is it supposition? Consider it so. You're a watchman. You're supposed to watch. Time has proceeded on from this until you begin to see uh, it come all the way up to 9-11 of 12, just before this center point was hit. Okay. And we had an attack in, in uh, Libya, a country that we have free. Okay. Free from what? Free from its ruler. Who took over? The Brotherhood, the Islamic Brotherhood. It would seem that our government is almost helping the Islamic Brotherhood take over. Look at Egypt. Now, you know, 14 years, a lot has passed in that time, and now we hit dead center. What does that mean? It's a benchmark. And certainly you want to be careful from this point out as to what transpires. You're a watchman. You're supposed to watch. Well, can, can we take that down? No, you can do whatever you want to with it. But when we only have this happen 25,800 years, you want to pay attention. It's important. And certainly um, it would appear from the signs that we're seeing exactly why that is. Open your Bibles, if you would, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul was converted in the year of our Lord, 37 A.D. But then, after his conversion, he was taken to a place. It would be 14 years before what we're taught. Well, there's that 14 again. Deliverance and salvation. He was taken to the third heaven and shown some things. A mystery. In... 19, in 53 A.D., he wrote his first epistle. What was that first epistle that Paul wrote? It's important. It was the, the first and second Thessalonians. They were the first epistles that Paul wrote in the New Testament, and some say that... Uh, they were the first entirely of the New Testament, be that as it may. Then in 57 AD, this bothers Paul. He wants to share it. So this is where we pick it up in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's 57 AD. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I'm going to tell you what the Lord said to me. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, that takes you back to 43, whether in body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Now, there are not different heavens. This is the third heaven age. It's where you will be after the millennium. He was showing things there. What did he say? Three. And I knew such a man, whether in body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Now, we know from his own writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, flesh and blood cannot enter heaven. So he was in his spiritual body. Verse 4 how that he was caught up into paradise, that's heaven, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. It's, it's not legal to. Why? God told him to hold it. Verse 5. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Uh, he didn't want to tell people he had been to the third heaven. Why? Because they would make something out of him that he wasn't. 
This man persecuted the church really more than anyone else. He was always guilty about that. So he, he, so, and you'll find why he wanted to be in his infirmities, weaknesses. Okay. Six. But though I would desire to glory, I'd like to really talk about it. I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. He was a plain man. God used him? Yes. Well, why did God use him? For our benefit. For all of God's children's benefit. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, people try to make something out of me I wasn't. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, listen to it carefully, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When you're the weakest, I'm the strongest. That's when he gives us help. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest in me. Now, <clears throat> It's important that we understand as best we can what that revelation was. Because it, um, and Paul kind of, he lets you know if you pay attention to his writings. <clears throat> Again, I will emphasize what was his first writing. After all those years, it was Thessalonians. But we're going to take a little short, turn over a book or two past this to Ephesians. And let's, let's analyze and let's piece together. Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensations of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, if you've heard that God has spoken to me, that I have a, an opinion, and God has led me into knowing what's going to be, what those dispensations mean. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words. What did he write about that mystery? Romans, the 16th chapter. I want you to know something. This, this word mystery is uh, is mystery re and and calling it a mystery doesn't cut it and this is important beloved listen carefully mystery rion what does it really mean being translated it means a sacred secret or divine secret there's a lot of difference in mystery and a divine secret. It is for this reason that only certain ones have ears to hear, that have eyes to see. Why? Because they are chosen to pick up on that mystery, that divine secret. And it's really not a secret anymore because Paul in his teachings has brought it forth and brought it forth strongly well, what does it have to do with the return of Christ and our salvation? And, and certainly he makes that very clear. But again, it's important that you know. Mystere, rion, means not mystery, but a divine truth. And you need that divine secret. And we gain it by studying God's word. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will understand it. Verse 4. Whereby when you read, you must understand my knowledge in the mystery, 
That's that divine secret of Christ. He gave it to me. Okay. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It's, it's now made known that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise of Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of Christ given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Not mine. I can't boast about it, he's saying. But Christ gave it to me. I want to deliver, to teach, to lead, to comfort. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, and, and so it was that he would. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That's to say the divine secret, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus. You know, it wasn't a secret 25,800 years ago. That's when it began to formulate. That's when the overthrow took place or was leading to it. Verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places those are even angels, both bound and free, good and bad, demonic and, and loving, both to all, in other words. Places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. What God wants you to know, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, is he's still on the throne. If, and if you know this divine secret, you've got nothing to worry about. Because you know what befalls us in this generation. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, it was there all the time. <clears throat> now, let's go to Paul's. Why would he, here he wants to tell, he wants people to know. So here is his first epistle written in 53 AD. This is, in 43 he was taken to the third heaven. It was 57 when he wrote there in Corinthians where we were reading. But he, he wanted, so naturally, when he has the opportunity to write his first epistle, if you pay close attention and you pick up on the subject, you're going to know what's going to happen. Uh, let's go to 1 Thessalonians, and let, let's just play a little game here of, of picking Paul's mind. What, what is he trying to tell us? What is the subject of Thessalonians, which is to say Paul's first letter? It was most important to him that this message come forth, uh, Read the 10th verse of chapter 1. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. In other words, the return of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Skip to the verse 19 of chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? His coming is the subject. And this is why Paul stressed, he pulled, he wanted you to see and to understand. Go on to chapter 3. Go to the last verse of chapter 3, verse 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, all those that have passed on that have served him, all people that knew that divine secret, and God took them home, putting together an army there. 
to bring back with him when he comes. And we're approaching that time sooner than many might think. But at the same time, if you know the divine secret, you know the chronological order of events. By that I mean, you know what must happen first before he returns. And when you realize what has happened in the last 14 years, it's leading right to it. I mean, it is a carbon copy. Why would Paul say 14 years? Why would he wait 14 years? Delivery and salvation. That's the message. And of course, uh, I, I need not go into chapter 4 because that's where many people think they're going to fly. Okay. All he was saying is, all those that have passed on are with him. They've risen as he is. And so it is. Let's read a few verses, though, of chapter 5. Paul's mind in his first epistle, listen to it. He'd been to the third heaven. He had these messages that it was illegal to go into every detail, but he's teaching so that it comes out slowly and graciously. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Why? Because you, if you listen to him, you already know. For yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You see, you're a child of the day, though. You're never in the night. So you're going to know, but the people that do not know the divine secret, they will be deceived. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as to veil upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape the birth of a new age. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Why? The divine secret. Not going to overtake you. You're a child of the day, and you know and understand. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. You're not of Satan. We don't listen to him. Now, Paul continues on into, he wrote the second letter to the Thessalonians, and you've all heard me teach it many times. He wrote it while, Paul, while Timothy and Silas were still there. So it follows in the, at the same time, because he knew some had been deceived a little bit about the divine secret. He wants to straighten it out. So go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And bearing in mind, this is the first epistle and second that Paul ever wrote. He was bringing forth that divine truth, that mystery. And we'll document it before we finish here. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. What, what he's saying here, I beg you to listen to me. I want to tell you how it's going to be for when Christ returns. Here he's laying it out level, right on the table. And how it is when you gather back to Christ... Don't ever let anyone take this away from you because you're a child of light and you can see, know, and understand that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't listen to a bunch of yo-yos that might tell you something different. This is the way, he said, this is the way it's going to be. Now, what this shucks down to, you either believe God's word or you believe yo-yos. Okay. Now, that's just how simple it is. Paul was taken to the third heaven. That's where we will be. He was showing these things, and now he shares it. He said, it's real simple. You're a child of light. Don't let some word, some letter, even a letter from us, like chapter 4 of the last one. 
deceive you. It's not going to happen until these things happen. He's giving you the chronological order of events. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not, shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Don't ever let anyone tell you that Christ is returning be, before the Antichrist comes. They're not. He's not. But your whole destiny is to witness against the false one. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you know what? The whole world is going to follow him that is not familiar with the divine secret, the sacred secret, the truth. And it's so simple when you have eyes to see and ears to hear. A child can understand it. Your proof is, how many times have you tried to get someone without ears to hear to hear this? What did they say to you? It is not a thing that they are dumb or stupid. It's just that they have not been given the privilege of knowing the divine secret. Whereas you have. A child can understand it if they're chosen and if they earn that right naturally in the first earth age. But he's telling you here exactly how it's going to be. Now, you're going to hear people say, though, there's going to be terrible wars. There's not. Okay. This dude comes in peacefully and prosperously. And when he comes in that way, that's not what people are being fed. That's not what they're expecting. But it's what you know is going to happen. So do not be deceived by that false peace. Though it may look good, it may taste good, it may seem good. It's the false one himself. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. We talked about it, remember? Verse 9, For now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. When it's time for him to come, you'll know it. Just like that. You know what he's going to do? He's going to sit in Jerusalem claiming to be God. Listen carefully. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There's that mystery again. That's the divine secret. It's already working. Only he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way. You've always heard me say that's a transitive verb. And you have to transfer back to verse uh, uh, 4 where um, he stands in the holy place, the temple claiming to be God. Who is it that holds him? Michael does. You can read it in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Michael holds him until his time that he and his angels, and there'll be more than the four that are loose now. There'll be more than that cast out with Satan. They cannot harm you, though. Why? You're a child of God. And you have that divine secret. They don't have to tell you when the time is. You know it. You're a child of the day. But the night is coming. And the night is darkness and Satan's lies and misleading people. So hang on to that precious truth for the mystery. That's the materion, the divine secrets already working. It's here with us now. And then shall they then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When Christ does come. It's over for Satan, and it's over for those that, are, that follow him. The subject still is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. This eighth verse declares it. 
even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. That's the false messiah. That's a role that Satan will play. That office is taken from him and cast into the lake of fire. He will be loosed for a short season at the end of the millennium, but he will not have that power again. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, listen to what God's going to do. God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. And they love it. Okay. Once they grab that lie, there's nothing you can do about it, basically, unless God touches them. And, and that in itself proves the word of God is true. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification. That's what 14 stands for. through sanctification of the spirit and the belief of the truth. The truth, when you begin to absorb that divine secret, that sacred secret, which is translated mystery in Paul's writings, wherein too he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Can you do that? Stand fast in the Lord Jesus. Don't listen to yo-yos that would tell you any different than how this is written. This is line by line, act by act, exactly how it's going to go down. Paul was taken to the third heaven and showing this in person, right from the throne of God. So don't let some yo-yo deceive you this is how it happens. Uh, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation of good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And so he does. What is the good word and what is the good work? The divine secret. The sacred secret. And really there's nothing secret about it. We have many things that will be happening in this year. Do not, I mean, these things must happen before Christ returns. But we are coming to that point where you're going to see things. There is a comet that has just been discovered that is moving closer in that's going to put on quite a show before this year is over. It will go very near the sun. We'll be talking more about that at Passover and about other things in relationship to this. Now, I want to leave one th thought in closing, and I may be closing a little early, but I've had it, okay? <laughs> this is it. A racer of taxes mouthing doesn't get it done. It's when the man actually physically raises the taxes that he becomes the gather of taxes. When did that happen? January the 1st, 2013. So you're living in an interesting time, and you're going to see many prophecies come to pass. So i leave that with you, because many people get the cart before the horse. They get anxious. Look at facts. Analyze. We've known this ecliptic happening for quite some time. But it, now is only time to look at it in detail. Fourteen years. It took to go from the line to the center. And in that 14 years, we should have been, we were awake to what was happening. But this nails it, whereby you have a better opportunity. 
And certainly we will pick this up. It's continued until Passover. So um, what can I say to you? I love you. He is on the throne. And you've got nothing to worry about. We have the power of the living God. Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. From Georgia, my question is, will Father forgive me if I have made any mistakes in talking about the Bible with people or overloading uh, uh, one's donkey? Well, you know, always do your homework. There's nobody perfect, but um, make sure you're not misleading someone by doing your homework, by studying the Word of God. And when, when you teach something, like you will hear me say sometimes, this is an educated guess. That means I, I am speculating, so to speak, but I'm letting the student know that I am. Otherwise, if I make a declaration, I can document that from Scripture. So that's the way you teach. You give people that opportunity to take advantage of what you have discerned in years of study by giving an educated uh, summar summarization or guess, if you wish to put it that way. But always do your homework and pray that God gives you the truth. If a person waited till they were perfect to teach or plant seeds, there would never be any planning because none of us are perfect. A doctor from Pennsylvania, I enjoy listening to you reading the verses of the Bible. I would like for you to read Mark 10, verses 11 and 12, also verse 19. And what the good doctor is probably concerned about, both verses have to do with if you are divorced and have a living husband or wife, uh, if you remarry, you're in adultery. That's, that's what uh, the word says. Now, that is someone that's living in sin. They divorce in sin. They never ask for repentance because if they were Christians and living a Christian life and they went to the Father and asked forgiveness, do you believe that the Father would give them forgiveness? That's the price Christ paid on the cross. And certainly divorce and adultery are not the unpardonable sin. Nowhere can you, can, will you ever find they're unpardonable. Therefore, if one repents, it's pardoned. And they become a new creature. And they are free to remarry. You would rob people of the strength of Christianity, the gifts from God, if you were to teach otherwise. You put limits on Christ's ability to forgive sin because there are many people that marry too young to really be married for one reason or the other. And they're not, they are not fully aware of what Father's Word says. They make errors and God makes allowances. So anytime you can document to me that um, divorce or adultery are the unpardonable sin, and I can guarantee you they're not, okay? I know what the unpardonable sin is, and it's not that. Okay. You'll find the unpardonable sin in Luke 12, 10. But anyway, be that as it may, good doctor, uh, carry on. 
uh, Mary from North Carolina. First, I want to thank God for revealing your teachings to me and my husband. I was so confused before. I prayed to God to show me the truth, and he led me to Shepherd's Chapel. Uh, there was someone the other week that was talking about a habit he had and what to do. Well, I had a habit, a drinking habit, for about 30 years. I wanted to stop and better myself, but I couldn't. And I heard you one day talking about how to talk to God and to be honest with him. So I started praying and talking to God and asking him to give me the strength to stop. I talked to him every day. At first, I felt I was not worthy of him to listen to me, but I never gave up. Then one day, I woke up and I stopped drinking and smoking. I no longer have a desire to anymore because I know now that he hears me when I talk to him, and I know that he loves me. So I think the key is to never give up and let him know you really want to stop. Well, bless your heart, Mary. That's, that's well written, and that's exactly what I teach. Don't make God promises you can't keep. When you see you're having trouble and can't handle it, ask his help. And, um, and, and, and do it, uh, and he will do it. He, every hair on your head is numbered. Thank you for the letter. Uh, Ed from Texas. I'm trying to explain to a friend of mine in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. The word world, the world was, the word was, should be become, became rather. He's looking for backup. Maybe you can explain this better than me. I'll record it and let him watch. Well, your answer will, you will find in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. It's one place, because it simply states there that God did not create this world void, but he created it to be inhabited, and then it became void. Uh, that's tuhu in the Hebrew. It means totally void. So Isaiah 45, 18 will help you with that. Tony from California. Thank you for you and your staff. You do bring Bible truth to, to God's people. Thank you. In the past, I have studied with another Christian organization who believed the Antichrist is a man who may be here now. I think they get this from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. In Revelation 13, 18, where the Antichrist is referred to as a man, why do those uh, passages refer to the Antichrist as a man? Well, um, because he is. Who were we made in the image of? Let us make man in our image. What does, what does the word Gabriel mean? I mean, this is an archangel. What does the word Gabriel mean? in the Hebrew tongue. It means man of God. And when, when you quote Second Thessalonians 2, 3, it's addressed to one specific anthropos, that's man. It's the son of perdition. There's only one. You'll find who it is in Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. It's Satan. So, yeah, he's referred to as a man. And, uh, and so it is. Uh, but it's Satan himself. Okay. When, uh, let me give you another one. Isaiah chapter 14. When, O Lucifer, the son of the morning, why is it you have fallen from heaven up onto the earth? And he was cast into a pit. And the people of the earth would walk up to the abyss and say, Is this the man? Is this the ish that deceived the world? In other words, he's called a man. There's no, no, no problem with that. It's one specific one. The name's Satan, the devil, and, and so it, the old Antichrist. Merlin from Minnesota, a question for Pastor Murray. Please explain 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, it means exactly that. When you read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, when the clay pot breaks, means you die instantly your spirit, the intellect of your soul, and your spiritual body returns to the Father. So naturally, those that die go first because they're already gone. Okay. 
Now, I know that some people make a religion out of saying the graves are going to open, and that's a lie. We're through with these flesh bodies when at death because you've got a beautiful spiritual body that doesn't age, it doesn't wither, it doesn't get sick. You wouldn't want these things back. That's why Ecclesiastes chapter 9 says these flesh bodies go into the grave, turn back to dirt, and they're, they're never even remembered anymore. Dorothy from Kentucky. If you try to commit suicide and then realize it was wrong and ask for forgiveness, will God forgive me for that? I really need to know. Thank you. Well, of course, you didn't. it's forgivable because you didn't do it. But suicide is murder. And, um, and naturally, murder, he wants to talk to murderers up there. And he says, send them up to me. So that would, then you might have, if you, if you had accomplished it, you might have something to be concerned about. But you didn't, so it's forgivable. Repent, go in peace, and sin no more. Uh, Darlene from New York. I'm, my beloved husband died January the 31st, 2012. Well, we're, we, we um, our sympathy to you. I really miss him, and I'm having a difficult time getting through this. My question is, what do they do up in heaven? Do they eat, sleep, visit each other all day? Please help me to understand. My heart is breaking. Well, well rejoice now that he's with the Father. Read, read the 16th verse of the great chapter of Luke concerning the beggar, Lazarus, and the rich man. Lazarus, who loved the Lord, and I'm sure your husband did, because it's obvious you both study with the chapel and, and love the Lord, uh, he's, he's with, with the Father and, and with the rest of, uh, uh, of God's children. And they are very happy. It tells you in Luke chapter 16, they're rejoicing right with Abraham and the other children. So uh, that's uh, naturally we grieve when we lose a loved one because half of you is gone. <clears throat> but um, time heals and uh, God has a purpose for him and for you. And you keep searching for that purpose and you'll do just fine, okay? Uh, Harold from Florida, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 8. What is a child doing in the millennium? It's a figure of speech. It means that it is so safe. Speaking of safety is what it means. It is so safe that a child could do that. Okay. You know, an adult, it would not have impl implicated the fact of safety as much if it was an adult because adults usually know how to handle a snake. Okay. But a child doesn't. They'll pick them up, right, necessarily. And um, it's simply a statement. We're all the same age in the millennium. Spiritual bodies are all the same age. And, um, and very, very healthy and usually very happy if you made it to the right side of the goal. Simply a statement uh, meaning safety. Mar Marie from Montana. What does the Bible say about predestination? Does God have a few chosen people he is going to save, or is everyone going to have a chance to go to heaven? Everyone's got a chance to go to heaven. But, but he does have an election that he will interfere in their lives uh, to bring to pass the scripture as it is written. But most people have free will to love Christ, to find the word, and be servants of the living God. Not one is any better than the other. It's just that God's election, even when Satan rebelled in the beginning, they stood against him. He didn't snow them. And God knew he could trust them. You can read of predestination in Romans chapter 8, long about verse 26. He says, hey, you set aside ones. That's what a saint is. That's elect. You, you don't even know what to pray for. That's why I intercede in your lives, because you are predestined, foreordained. Um, why? Because you earned it. It's not because you were the prettiest or anything of that nature. You earned it, and so it is given freely to by our Father. Ruth from Indiana. What country does the Antichrist come from? The Antichrist does not come from a country. The Antichrist comes from heaven. 
this this is very difficult for some people to get a handle on because they say, well, what is the Antichrist doing in heaven? He's being helped there by Michael. Have, have you never read Revelation chapter 12? Where he is helped there. His evil spirit can traverse the earth. To and fro he can go. His evil spirit. But physically, he's locked in heaven. That's why Christ said, get behind me, and he is behind the throne, locked. Who is he helped by? Well, the word tells you, Michael and his angels. And But there is a time coming very soon when Michael and his angels are going to cast Satan and his angels back down on earth. And they know they have but a short time, and that's when he comes playing Jesus. Only he's the false Jesus. He's not Christ. He's instead of Christ, which is called Antichrist. Uh, Rhonda from Georgia, if someone goes to the wrong side of the Gulf, is there a chance to go back to the right side of the Gulf before the end? No, there isn't. But there is the millennium. If we were to call, if you, if you call the end of this earth age, then that would be one thing. But by the end of the millennium, they will have an opportunity. Through the millennium, if they had, if they had um, no opportunity to really know the truth, uh, then there will be many saved during the millennium. I know that, that a lot of people resent that, but it's true. Uh, that's why God would not foolishly have a thousand-year period if there wasn't teaching there. Well, how can you document there's teaching? Uh, Revelation 20, verse 5, God's elect are priest with Christ for a thousand years. Well, what do priests do? They teach. They teach God's word. Uh, they will teach discipline mostly in the millennium because in spiritual bodies, most of them will know what the word is, but uh, there will be a lot of them lacking discipline. Uh, all will have a chance in a spiritual body to decide whether they love God or whether they're going to follow Satan. Those that choose Satan in the end, we'll go into the abyss with him. That is to say, the lake of fire. God is a consuming fire. Michael from South Carolina. What scripture says the gulf in heaven where God and Abraham are on one side? The scripture is Luke 16. Well, it seems like we're having that come up quite a bit today. Luke 16. It is a parable that's a little unusual because it's written about two actual men a parable about two actual men who both died and went to paradise. Why did Christ teach that? So that we would know what happens in paradise. So we know kind of what people do in paradise. Or uh, Paradise is a part of heaven. Okay? And um, I, I think I have a work called the Gardens of God. That means the paradises in different spots of God's word. Jim from California. In Matthew, it says when two people are working in a field, one will be taken up. There is the one taken up to heaven and the other staying to fight is uh, one taken by Antichrist. The whole subject. Always when you're studying, watch the subject, watch the article, what is being discussed in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 when one is taken. The fact that the Antichrist comes first and that you're delivered up before him. It's the greatest tribulation since the beginning of time. It's Satan on earth with his fallen angels. And many are going to be taken by him. <clears throat> but you are to stay in the field working. Uh, the one taken, unfortunately, is taken by Antichrist. There, there's many that teach you're going to fly away. You, don't, you won't be here in the tribulation. And unfortunately, that's kind of the message that the Antichrist brings forth. This is why Paul wrote chapter 2 in 2 Thessalonians. Because the first book concerning the so-called gathering back to Christ deceived a lot of people. <clears throat> so he wrote in chapter 2, I want to talk to you about our getting back to Christ. It's not going to happen. Don't let my first letter, don't let some spirit or man tell you any different. Christ is not returning until after the son of perdition, that Satan, stands in the holy place claiming to be God. 
you're going to live through that if you live in this generation of the fig tree. But uh, that's all right. We can cut it. There's no problem whatsoever. Elliot from Ohio. Will you please explain 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18? My church believes in the rapture, but I don't thank you. A lot of time for this today, huh? Well, verse 13 says, If you believe Christ uh, rose from the dead, you better believe all the others that believe upon him have risen also. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. And then it goes on to say that those that the, the, the dead rise first, why they're already with him, but at the seventh trump, not the sixth when the Antichrist comes, but at the seventh trump, we will all meet him in spiritual bodies, quite frankly, as it's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. In the wink of an eye, at the sound of the farthest trump out, that's the seventh, um, then we will gather. Otherwise, we're going through Antichrist's reign. You can count on it. That's why I told you, you're saying 1 Thessalonians. That's why I said you should read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul uh, straightens this situation out. And we be out of time, so I say to you, studying God's word, I love you for that, but most important, God loves you for it. It makes his day when you read the letter he sent to you and let him know you love him. It makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. Father loves his children that study the letter. Now, uh, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, again, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, when you listen to me and you listen good, you stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. This has been a long time I've been promising a children's book. This is a book that will help uh, a parent teach their child exactly what God's Word states. Now, uh, this, this was done by a very good friend and student of this chapel. We have given it, if you would, a binder whereby if there is a page that you feel is too far advanced for your children, then by all means you should remove that particular uh, page. It is done in a material that is even washable, and it takes you step by step into instructing a child what does God's Word say. And I, I think you will find it extremely helpful. It is item number 4414.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back into our Father's Word, talking about the rupture doctrine. I'm sorry, the rapture theory, as we get right into it here today. And, um, and document. Now look, men say this and men say that. If you're going to follow Christ, follow what he says. And in this 13th chapter of Mark, he's telling us exactly, and I do mean precisely, in detail.